I thought that going after a bucket list was selfish. So we didn't really tell people. But then people were inspired to do their list just by the fact that we were doing our list. Yeah. And all these kids around the country were starting to go after their list through the show. And I was like, holy shit. You, by doing what you love, you inspire other people to do what they love. And that ripple effect goes so far. Like, yeah. You'll never know that impact. It's like Lewis's ripple effect with you from his podcast is the impact you're having by your podcast and the impact that you have for kids listening to your podcast, the impact they'll have, you can draw that back to Lewis. You can draw Lewis's, you know, his inspiration to start his pod probably back to someone else. Yeah. Maybe whether it's Tim Ferriss or maybe it's a friend. And so the person that in, I can draw Buried Life back to the kid that started the clothing line in high school. Purpose in the youth. Purpose in the youth. Purpose in the youth podcast. Welcome, welcome back. Welcome back to the Purpose in the Youth podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Purpose in the Youth podcast. What's your favorite bearded man? The one, the only Bob. Hey. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Purpose in the Youth podcast. What's your favorite bearded man, the one, the only, Bob Bay, today in the building? Ben Nemton, how you doing, my man? Excellent. Dude, pleasure to have you here today. Excited, man. Excited. If, if the 16, 17-year-old beardedless Bob A knew that he was going to be sitting down and having a conversation with you at some point in his life, he would not believe it. <laughs> sitting on my couch, chicken bee mask, with my sister by my side watching Buried Life, then the life of Jinx, I think, was after yeah. that. I, dude, I can't even believe I'm saying this. I have the same type of feeling that I had when I had drama on the podcast because that was also somebody, Fantasy Course. Factory, Robin yeah. Big. And to just to see like the world full circle, it's it's crazy to me about or just how things can happen like this. Like you're here today to sit down with, with me and it's it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, man. Well, I'm I'm excited. Yeah. And I'm glad that this worked out and the way that it came about through Yes Theory and Got to give a shout out to Yes Theory. Yeah. And, kind of yeah, it's a small world. It, it all, and these things always, you know, happen for the right reasons and um I'm I'm stoked. And and to also to hear drama in the intro. Yeah. It's oh, the, really cool. Yeah. That yeah. means a, that, that that's a big uh that was a big podcast for me because when I was putting together this this concept of purpose in the youth I was still putting together the pieces of it and he had launched his. Mm -hmm. So I told you yesterday, Lewis Howes really inspired me to start mm -hmm. a podcast. Seeing drama stay so consistent from afar felt like my, my, uh, my almost like a trainer, like a personal mm -hmm. trainer, like keep showing up. I'm showing up every week. So do you, you mm -hmm. need to keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the second person that really influenced me. And then the third was Gary Vee for that first year. It was like, like my mental coach of just consuming mm -hmm. his content all the mm -hmm. time. But mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, drama. Drama's played a, a huge inspiration uh, from afar, just getting me to where I am today. Yeah, and such a good guy. Yeah, such a great guy. Yeah, I know. It was great listening to your podcast with him. I, I first listened to it when it came out back in December, I think, of 2018. But then mm -hmm. I re-listened to it yesterday just to kind of, you know, pick up on some of the smaller details that you guys talked about. And that was a uh, just a real authentic conversation. And it was good to hear two guys who kind of came up together in different paths, but. Same, really, MTV kind of put a light to you guys and really jump started. I feel like your guys' career. Yeah, and it was it was cool to connect with him to talk about it because I don't get to talk about that era with someone who was also doing pretty much the exact same thing. Yeah, in a different silo, but really like you know, at that time it was uh, so it was cool to, to reminisce and 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 man, I, yeah, I'm I'm so impressed with with him and we've become closer since then and just uh so yeah it's it's one of those things that you just uh eventually you're gonna get into contact with all the people that you want to become in contact with if mm. you're patient you know you have the right intentions you're honest yeah you know eventually it, it'll happen you just got to continue to like most people fail just before they're about to succeed i think so it's just like persistence 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 mm. and then being a good person and ultimately you know, you'll figure out the way because you just need one yes, right? Yeah. You can get like a hundred, you can get a thousand no's. Yeah. You can get a, you know, <laughs> a million no's. You just need one yes. Yeah. So anyways, that's sort of, I think a good mentality to have is just, you just, you just keep going until you get that yes. Yeah. And, uh, and you, you know, and then you get more and more yeses as you go. And it, in the beginning, it just takes 
longer, but uh, that patience and persistence is key. So I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to uh, to, to kick off. Yeah. If we're what gonna, is it, 141? Th- this will be technically, yeah, this will actually be 140. I think this will be 141 because next week will be 140 and then you'll be 141. Yeah. How would you, you already knew that. Dude, I'm the super fan. <laughs> oh That's what I'm talking about. I thought, I thought it was the fan of Bump. Come <laughs> no, on, I'm man. Bigger now. <laughs> we're we're going to deep dive into everything, um, but I really, I really enjoy the process of kind of painting a picture to where you got to where you are today. Mm-hmm. You know, we see you as the New York Times bestselling author. Most people, I would hope, know about the Barry life and they see the incredible work you guys have done over the last 10 years. You're an international speaker. But before we get into any of that, I want to paint a picture of what it is like for young Ben mm. growing up in Victoria, British Columbia, right outside of Seattle. Yeah. What What does this life look like for you? So I'm living in... It's kind of like Pleasantville, you know, mm-hmm. where I'm on an island off of Vancouver near Seattle. It's beautiful, Pacific Northwest. Um, life is really good. You know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm heading to university. I have a scholarship, an mm-hmm. academic scholarship. I am big into rugby because rugby is really big on the West Coast of Canada and can in Canada in general. It's just like a big sport. Which is and, surprising me because I feel like, well, hockey's definitely got to be the number hockey's one. Hockey's number one, number two, one. and three. Like, and then <laughs> rugby. They give you a stick when you come out the womb. Like, here you go. They bring gone. you out with a stick. That's how they get you out of. <laughs> and then, so I played hockey for. You have to play hockey when yeah. you're young. So I played hockey for a number of years, and then I transitioned into like rugby. So I made the national U19 rugby team, which was like. Big, big dream. Mm. I had a scholarship to university. I was also on the university team. Um, and life was really, uh, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was great. Like I was really um, feeling good about my next phase of life, which was, which was university. Um, training for the World Cup, which was in Paris, France. Mm-hmm. I'm the field goal kicker and the quarterback type of position is called, called the fly half. Mm-hmm. So the fly half is, is a lot of pressure on the fly half. And so I'd practice my field goals leading up to the World Cup, and I was, I would always put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed naturally, like growing up. Yeah, all the time. and know it. Yeah, and and my, I try and think back about why, and we can talk about that later. It wasn't my parents. It wasn't. It was self inflicted, and I think it had to do with something that happened to me when I was younger. But anyhow, we can get into that later. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed, and so I started. Um, worrying about my field goals and i was like shit what if i miss in a really easy field goal at the world cup yeah like what if i straight right in front of the goal post just just blow it <laughs> and this is like my biggest chance i mean and you know i'm 19 20 years old this is my life and i i that is the worst thing that i could ever think of happening right mm. is, is messing and i i couldn't get this thought out of my head like it just was sort of it would come to me at night and it would come in the form of anxiety. And I had actually missed a big field goal in high school yeah. and lost. Uh, it was at the end of the championship games, similar to the state championships, but it was the provincial championships because we were in Canada. So it's provinces instead of states. But, a, you know, a big game and it was the final finals and I had a chance to tie it up and I missed it. Hmm. And that haunted me. And I was like, shit, what if that happens again? What if you relive the moment? So, because, you know, that was traumatizing, right? And so, high school, especially too. Like, that's. I just felt so bad. I was like, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe it. And it just weighed on me. I was like, what if I do that again? I can't have that happen again. And so, this anxiety was growing in me. And right now, I was putting a lot of my pressure pressure on myself to do well academically because I had an academic scholarship. So, I wanted to keep that up. And. So I started losing sleep over these, you know, all the all these feelings that were going on, right? Anxiety, losing sleep. And this started this downward spiral for me where ultimately I got depressed. And I ultimately dropped out of school, lost my scholarship. I dropped I got dropped from the rugby team because I couldn't go to practice. I became a shut in in my parents' house, a recluse couldn't leave the house i dropped out of school because i just didn't go to class because i couldn't go to class like i my parents would drive me to school and i couldn't get out of the car so we drive back home so eventually by default i dropped out of school and i was totally immobilized by this Mm. and
And this is going from 100 to zero, like quick in a matter of months. And it, it, it's this dark downward spiral where I was just so afraid of how far it could go down, you know, mm-hmm. like the dark, like the, in the, in the, in the, the deep dark night, like I would just remember just being so scared, like how bad can this get? Like, how could it get worse than this? And it was just terrifying. And so I, you know, my parents were really obviously just beside themselves. They didn't know what to do to help. And yeah. I, they would just encourage me to go for a walk every day. Like it was at the point where I just would go for a one fifteen minute walk every day, but I'd hide in the driveway and come back and tell my parents. That so I went, I went for, for a walk, walk but yeah. you really were just waiting to go. Back I was just inside. like, I, I didn't, you know, I was just this total frozen by these, uh, by the depression and by these feelings. And, and so at that point, like cut to the beginning of the summer after the semester I dropped out of, my friends convinced me to come with them to a new town to work for mm-hmm. the summer. You know, it was like the just standard, like, it's summertime. We're going to get a couple of buddies and go work in another town, have fun, and then come back to school. Still, like, in your greater area? Of- this was actually, we went to Banff, Alberta. So, pretty cool. You know, it was, uh, I don't know, 10 hours away or something. Oh, wow. Okay. So, it was a, it was a different it, world. It was oh, a different you're world. You're away. You're away. And so, I went there and, and slowly started to feel feel better like and there were a a lot of things in the long run that ended up it's kind of contributing to me just maintaining my well-being but a couple things that helped right away was like i got a job so i started feeling some Mm self-worth i started to talk about what i was going through to my friends you know and ultimately to other people about these feelings that i was having i started to understand that they i wasn't the only person in the world to have these feelings in fact there are many people that feel like this all the time and um i met young people that were really inspiring right and i do you not have that growing up not so much not so much i had a great group of friends but i hadn't met people that had done um extraordinary things Hmm. and there was one kid from uh, my high school that ended up starting a clothing line that when i came back from this trip away I was like you know what I'm gonna try and only surround myself with people that inspire me just Mm -hmm. like these new kids that I met and that one decision completely changed the course of my life like the reason I'm sitting here is because of that one decision Mm -hmm. of consciously trying to surround myself with people that inspire me because I know I there was this kid from high school that started a clothing line out of nowhere and I was like whoa that's so cool and I was like, how did you do that? Like, mm. I want to get involved. Is there any way I can help you with this clothing line? And he was like, well, if you can help, like, with press. And I ended up getting him into a blog. And he was like, um, and that was that was a good thing for him at the time. And, and I was like, well, I can't believe how easy that was. Who else can I connect with? What do I want to do? Like, if he mm. made a clothing line, what do I want to do? And I thought, I want to make a movie. And so there was this kid from... The neighborhood that I didn't know too well. His name was Johnny. <laughs> Johnny Penn. Johnny Penn, <laughs> the self-taught so, filmmaker. Same, same neighborhood as you? Yeah. Literally. Two block, three blocks away. Oh God. Him and Duncan grew up a couple blocks away. Who's I older, knew, Johnny or Duncan? Duncan's older. Johnny's younger than me. Johnny <laughs> took my sister to prom. That's how I knew him. Oh so I was like, ooh. Younger or older sister? Younger. Ooh, I yeah. got a younger sister too. So that, I know yeah. that. Yeah, and they were like, we went as friends. And I was like, okay. Yeah, okay. 12 o'clock, no later. She we'll better see. be home. <laughs> and so, yes. so we, so Johnny had made movies with his friends in the summer and they would screen them in the neighborhood. And I like knew about these movies, right, that he was making. And I, he had posted a video on Facebook. And this is like early, early Facebook when it was just in colleges. Mm-hmm. And I saw it. And it was him and his friends just like partying and having fun at first year at McGill University. And so I knew he was a filmmaker. And so I, I was like, I want to make a movie with my friends. So I called him up. By the way, it took like four or five phone calls because he just kept ignoring. He didn't know who it was. <laughs> and he finally picked up. I was like, Johnny, let's make a movie. And he was like, you know what? I, was just, I just came back from Cuba with my friend Dave. And we were talking about doing something like this. And then Duncan totally uh, separately came up to me in the bar a couple weeks later and was like, yo, we should do something. I was like, I just talked to your brother, Johnny. Let's get on <laughs> Skype with him and Dave and we can 
talk about making our movie. Wow. So that's what we did. We're all like in different sides of the country. Two of them, uh, or actually Duncan as well, was in Montreal. They were going to school. Yeah. Duncan, Dave, and Johnny. And I was in Victoria. And we got on Skype. We started talking about making a movie. And we had no idea what we wanted to make a movie about. And we kept coming up to these dead ends creatively. Like we'd lose steam on these ideas. And then, what were some of the early ideas? Oh, it was like um, we wanted to... We wanted to do like a pro-social sort of like a movie about a community in the north. Like so, we have like First Nations communities mm-hmm. uh, in Canada, and we wanted to kind of like shed some light on the youth there and what they were doing. And and ultimately, we realized we were trying to make the movie that we thought other people wanted us to make, not the movie that we want to make. And so finally, after like a bunch of creative dead ends, we're like, okay, fuck it. Like, what if you could make a movie about anything? What would it be? Mm. And how about we all go and make a list of all the things we want to make a movie about, if we could do anything. And so we all did that, and we came back on Skype, and we read everyone read through their ideas of the movie they want to make, and everyone got excited. They're like, oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. And finally, I think it was Duncan was like, well, why don't we just do all these things? <laughs> and that's when the list started to form. Uh-huh. So now we were making this list of things that we'd always wanted to do, basically. Then Johnny sitting at first year English class, McGill University, the professor assigns him a 150 year old poem called The Buried Life. Mm. So he reads the poem, he sends it to us. He's like, guys, read this, especially these four lines, right? And so he's, I know the lines are, but often in the world's most crowded streets, but often in the din of strife, there rises an unspeakable desire after the knowledge of our buried life. And he's like, guys, this poet 150 years ago is articulating this feeling that we can't articulate, which is we have all these things that we want to do, but we haven't done them because they're buried. Yeah. And we have moments when we're inspired, but ultimately that inspiration gets buried by the day to day. So why don't we call this movie The Buried Life, even though we didn't really know what it was going to be about. Okay. And then then we thought, how do we unbury our dreams, like our buried dreams? And so then we came up with this question, what do you want to do before you die? Mm Mm-hmm. Because the thought of death was the only thing that shook us enough to actually realize what was truly important. Like it put things in perspective. You're going to die. Your time's limited. What do you want to do? So then this list grows out of this question. And then, so now we have this que- this list of things to do before you die. And we think, well, why don't we go out and, and try and accomplish as many things on this list as possible. And because we can't do these things on our own, we're going to need the help of other people. Every time we cross something off our list... Let's help a stranger. We meet along the way, cross something off their bucket list. And mm-hmm. we'll just ask everyone we meet, what do you want to do before you die? And if we can help them, we will. And that's going to be uh, whether we have to walk, bike, or drive. We're going to do this road trip at the end of the summer for two weeks. And then we're going to go back to school and we're going to make a little movie out of it. Mm-hmm. So that's the mission, right? So this yeah. is in like maybe February of 2006. We're like, we're doing this. The Buried Life documentary it's going to take us two weeks. No ideas how you're going to accomplish no it. No ideas. No I'm money re- in the bank. No money. No one's helping us. And so uh, we're going to do it at the end of the summer. So, okay. So we start planning. We build a website. We post our 100 things on our website, our list items, right? Um, we build a sponsorship deck. Mm. We, I start cold calling companies pretending we have a production company. <laughs> and I, I get a juice company to pay for our gas. Amazing. Johnny and Duncan, once the brothers, once it hits summer, they go up to the oil fields in Alberta. They work as a cleanup crew, make enough money so we can buy a camera on eBay and um, host our website, you know, pay for all that. And uh, I am working as a beer rep at the time. And I am uh, trading, (laughs) literally trading beer for things, which is totally (laughs) not what I was supposed to be doing. But I'm like... They're getting pushed. Don't worry, guys. Yeah. We, we're selling the beer. Don't oh, worry. Yeah, it's getting in hands. And so we, um, you know, throughout that next six months, beg, bore, and stole to make this tour happen. We board an RV. Um, we we would get stuff from local uh, shops and businesses. Red Bull gave us Red Bull. A mm-hmm. local granola bar company gave us granola bars. Um, and we were like, we're going to go on and film this doc and uh, go after our list. Okay? Mm-hmm. So... Cut to 2006, the end of the summer. We make matching T-shirts with the buried life on them. (laughs) It's like uh, we take the RV to a mechanic. The mechanic's like, 
this isn't going to make it back. <laughs> and we're like, whoa, that's this is a, a problem. Bar- this is a borrowed RV. Right? Borrowed RV. Yeah, so and you have to get it back. I, You're supposed to at least. We have to get it back, because, but we don't have the money to tow it back. Hmm. So this is like, there's a moment of truth where we're sitting on the curb the night before we're supposed to go, and we get the news from the mechanic, you know, that day. And I'm like, what are we going to do if this breaks down? Like, we're fucked. <laughs> And we're Push like, back yeah, again. and we, and then I remember Dave is just like, there's this silence, and Dave's like, we gotta go, we gotta go, and we come this far, we gotta go. Yeah, and that's one of the benefits of doing things with people, your friends, your They're people, pushing you, is pressuring like, you to do when it. When you feel any type of, you know, you're questioning or you feel down, you know, someone hopefully brings you up, yeah. and vice versa. Like that's the beauty of working with your friends or people that you care about. So so we take off. We're like, oh, fuck it. We're going to go. We, we, we take off. The first day we take off, we make the front page of our local newspaper. And I'm crossing off be a knight for a day. Oh. If we... I'm able to get a full suit of armor for yeah. free. And it's like I have a knight's armor with a sword and everything. And there's this kid that sees me as soon as I step out of the RV. He's got a plastic sword. He comes up to me and kneels down and I knight him. And mm. then all these kids come around and it's like front page of the newspaper. We're like, whoa. And it's provincial news. And then it's national news. And all of a sudden, we're starting getting all these emails coming in of people being like, yo, I saw your list. Number nine, ride a bull. I can help you. Or I saw number 41, make a toast to strangers wedding. I can get you in because I'm the best man at my friend's wedding. And this, this is all from the newspaper. Th- this is now, as we start to hit the road, all of a sudden... This is traditional media. This is pre-social media. Twitter, you know, come out. We just started using Twitter in 2007, but this is before that. But you're updating your website as you guys are doing things? Kind of, but they see the website, and it says what we're doing, and it says our list. Yeah. And mainly this is from radio. We would bum rush uh, radio stations. Mm -hmm. Anytime we pulled into a new city, we go straight to the radio station, park our RV that had, you know, we call them decals. You call them decals. (laughs) (laughs) And big difference. Yeah. And so, you know, we had like the it said, what do you want to do before you die on the side of the RV? Bold question for and, people to see that. Yeah. And so we would just go to these radio stations, park outside until they put us on the air. Yeah. And we talk about it. And then it was national n- news and we would get patched into, you know, the news stations. And so people were hearing about it. And so they would look our li- look up our list and then email us through our website. Right. So all of a sudden, we didn't think anyone would care about what we were doing. All of a sudden, we're getting bombarded with emails from people that want to help us and people sending us their dreams. I've always dreamed of flying a fighter jet. Can you help me? I've always dreamed of like singing a duet with Celine Dion. I've always dreamed of playing Augusta. Well, you know, wow. and, and I remember like looking at Johnny when we like checked our email inbox for the first time and we were like, whoa, what is going on? Yeah. This is crazy. What's well, something to be said about putting your dreams out there, telling the world your plans, and like letting people kind of help guide you along the way. Obviously, you have to go out and actually, you know, yeah. take the initial step, get the RV, get the money together. But then people want to see you. People want to cheer you on. Totally. Yeah. So it's, it's I always say like amazing what will happen when you give people a chance to be a hero, right? Mm. And like most people don't talk about their dreams because you get put in a vulnerable position because then people know if you fail you're worried about what the fear of what other people might think yeah um but ultimately those two fears are sort of more made up fears right they're sort of more imagined fears because like so fear fear is from research the number one thing that holds people back from pursuing their personal goals so fear of failure fear of what other people might think if you think about the fear of what other people might think um these are that's a very intuitive native fear, right? It's part of the human condition. Yeah. It's said that that comes from when we were hunter and gatherer, Mm -hmm. when you would go out for a kill and you didn't come back with a kill, you were at risk of getting kicked out of the tribe, right? So this is like been going on for centuries, but um, the truth is now (laughs) that doesn't serve us because the truth is people are generally thinking about you much less than you think they are, Mm -hmm. right? They're, too busy thinking about other, what other people are thinking about them. Yeah. So they're self-consumed with your their own stuff. So they're really not thinking about you. They just don't <laughs> care. Like you're not as important as you think you are. Yeah. So, and they're more accommodating than you think. And they're probably going to help you yeah. if you talk about it. So that whole fear of what other people might think is 
like closer to the made up fear. The fear of failure, as long as you have your basic needs met, mm -hmm. right? And that this is an important caveat to this example, like your Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have to have safety, shelter, food, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just assume you have those needs met because if you don't, then it's a different conversation. But if you do, the fear of uh, failure, if you're waiting for the right time to go after your goal or you are, uh, um, you just never do because you're afraid, you failed. That's a failure. Yeah. You never did your goal. But at least when you try and you fail, what you learn from that far outweighs any potential hit to your reputation. Mm -hmm. And that's potential mm -hmm. hit to your reputation. Ultimately, that failure is probably a course correction to success, Yeah. right? It's just like a change in direction on your journey, really. Is You're always moving failure. forward. It's just pivots. Exactly, because you even if you have to start from what you think is the beginning, what you learn something, so you take that with you on your next mm -hmm. path. So, you is know. There, is there any actual fears when you guys are kicking this off? Like, what's, what's that? Obviously, you guys are in your early 20s. You have this big vision. You think this is going to be amazing. You're getting an RV. You're getting food. You're getting everything together. But... Was there any actual fears or did you guys just feel like we're just going to go all in and wherever this ends up is is how it's going to play out? Yeah. So, well, first of all, we never thought it would ever go any farther than the two weeks. Like we were just making a little documentary for our friends that we were going to show in a neighborhood, you know, screening. Maybe we get into a small film festival, but there was no greater ambition other than let's just make a really fun movie. Yeah. The fears were around um, like – what happens if this RV breaks down financially? How do we deal with that? Um, we threw parties to fundraise, so we had made some money. <laughs> and so like we we were kind of, we didn't have much to lose because we didn't really in the beginning tell many people what we were doing because yeah. we didn't know how to explain it. Um, we didn't expect that people would care about our list. And that was the thing that was so surprising is that when we hit the road and people started reaching out being like, I can help you. Then we thought, wow, this is like, this is kind of hitting a, a nerve with people. Mm. And so, you know, it was, it was really, I think it was the persistence of in the beginning of just not giving up to fund it, to make it happen, you know, to work the extra jobs during the summer, to cold call dozens of times, you know, to, we, cause we had people when we reached out for sponsorship, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Is this for booze or something like that? We that I have an something? email that says, I'm not funding your, quote, <laughs> booze-fueled road trip. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's totally fair. At least you understand. Yeah. You guys at the time were like, what the hell? We got to go on the next one. Yeah. So I love how you guys approached the list where it was like, uh, we each, you have $100 million. Yeah. Nothing is impossible. Like, I think that's an important mindset that you guys have was like, we're going to treat this list as if there is no mountain too high enough. We're going to dream so big. I mean, some of the big items that you guys had written down in the beginning, especially like, obviously, as we'll keep going into this conversation, you end up crossing these off, but like play basketball with the president, you played with Obama, make it onto Oprah's show, you did that. Uh, kiss the Stanley Cup, you guys did that. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just amazing that you guys end up shooting so high and then everybody starts like, helping you out along yeah. the way when when you guys were making this list though was there one that you were just like there's no way there's no way we're doing this yeah most of them most of them. <laughs> yeah we never thought we'd do any of them honestly like it was it was kind of a joke for us we were like if we could do absolutely anything and we had all the money in the world like if you were a superhero yeah what would you do <laughs> and we were like we'll never do these but let's like put them down yeah and the whole thing that was so outrageous is they actually happened over time and that's the thing when you know slowly over the next number of years these things that we thought were impossible came off the list and finally you got to the point where you're like you have no choice but to believe that anything is possible mm. it just sort of dawns on you and you're like huh i guess you can kind of do anything you want yeah <laughs> right which is this totally bananas like realization that Really, anybody can have, um, and I hope everyone does have eventually, or you know, starts to understand that you can do whatever you want, right? Yeah. And it's just like there's tricks and there's tools you can use, and there's ultimately you know things that you can do to help 
um, help you get there. Yeah. But it starts with your your mind. Yeah. And uh, and and saying that you can. Yeah. Really. And and we kind of we fell into it. It's not like we were master gurus at nineteen and we're like <laughs> we're gonna you know it's the secret and yeah. we're going to uh, think it and then it'll happen and we're yeah. gonna put it out there and blah blah blah. And, uh, you know, have the intention. It's like, we didn't know any of that shit. We were just like, let's just do this for fun and let's pretend we can do anything. Yeah. And, and we got lucky, right? We really did. It was the, it was the right time. Um, it was the right chemistry between the four of us. And it just kind of was this lightning in a bottle that just happened. And, and so, you know, after that first tour, so two Which weeks, you guys. Two weeks. How many items did you did you cross off? Do oh, you a lot, way more than we thought. You know, like, um, you know, like twenty or something. I mean, we were, we like kicked a field goal. And we were, we were like, um, you know, we we saw the Stanley Cup that first time. We <laughs> it was that's amazing for Canadians. For yeah. you guys, you guys are like, this is the oh, Holy we were, Grail. This is bigger than the Bible. Oh my God, this I, is the Bible. If you Google the Buried Life Stanley Cup, you'll see a photo of the four of us beside the Stanley Cup. With our stupid matching T-shirts, just like with the biggest shit-eating grins on our faces, we're just like, "Yeah, we did it, okay, we, we did it." Um, and then, you know, and so, but the thing that was really the game changer was the first tour when we, the first person that we helped, Brent. Yeah, Brent. So we uh, got an email from Brent, and he's like, "Hey guys, before I die, I want to bring pizzas down to the homeless shelter," and. We were like, finally, someone we can help that doesn't cost us like a whole bunch of money. <laughs> Everyone wants to shoot to the moon, do some crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah, we're like, guys, we're broke. Yeah. Like, so we're like, we can buy a couple pizzas. Yeah. So we go, we meet Brent, we interview him, and he's like, the reason why I want to bring pizzas down to the homeless shelter was because I lived in that homeless shelter for many years. And the days that people brought in food were the best because it felt like someone cared, cared about. Yeah. So he's like, I want to do that. And he, we learned through this conversation that he got himself out of that homeless shelter by starting his own landscaping business. This landscaping business relied on his truck. His truck had broken down, and he was in, at the risk of losing everything, right? Because he was— That was his it, business. His business relied on his truck. And so we were like, hey, is there anything we can do to help? And he'd be like, the pizzas. So he'd never talk about the truck. And we're like, fuck, we got to figure out a way to get this guy a truck. Hmm. And so we— we went on the radio and we're like, if anyone has a truck and like nothing, and we go to a used car salesman and we're like, hey, we have $480 between the four of us. Uh, can we buy that $2,100 truck? <laughs> That's a bold <laughs> ask. And we told him Brent's story. And you guys are filming like on the spot. Too. Oh, yeah. Get, so the guy's probably yeah, like he, loving it, right? Yeah, he You're was, putting him on the spot. You tell him we had our like, <laughs> the camera we were using was the Sony. I forget what it was called. I had like a big red back. It was like, Look like the ones they use film feature films now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, so, and he's like, all right. So he gives us the truck. He then pays out of his pocket the insurance. The guy does. Yeah. The guy's legend. The owner of the used car lot. And so we just like take the keys, drive it up to Brent, toss him the keys. And he just stands there. He like bear hugs me starts to cry holds me for a long time and just like no one had done anything like this for him in his life right yeah and you know he just was so beside himself and it was a moment that really made a huge impact on the four of us it was the first time we'd ever helped someone yeah and so we're like whoa we got to keep doing this and so we came back from that two-week road trip and we had all these experiences and, you know, we checked our email inbox kind of more thoroughly and we had an email from a producer that was like, hey, I saw you guys on the news. Have you ever thought about making a TV show? That was on the list, right? We we're like, yeah, number 53. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we're trying we're to like, cross that off the list. <laughs> so we meet with this producer at this fancy hotel in Vancouver and, uh, He's like a big deal. He's uh, done. He like created Sports Center in Canada, and he's a legitimate senior producer. And so he's like, "If you want, we'll go to Toronto, meet the Canadian networks, and we'll talk about doing a show." So Johnny cuts a little we trailer of this 
two week road trip and we ended up putting on YouTube and it made front page of YouTube. This is like 2006. You can wow. lo- look up the Buried Life <laughs> trailer, 2006 video. It's it's like in a square. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So um, we talk with networks and they come back and they're like, we want to do a show. So we get the contract and we're looking it over and we're like, whoa, they're going to own everything. Like, and the fine print they were trying to kind of make it all. Yeah. Hey, make your show. We're here to support totally. you. Totally. And it's like, wasn't even fine print. It was just like, we own everything. And that's the way it is. You know, it's like, that's the way TV works. It's like, you come with an idea, you know, for the most part, the network or the production company. We're taking a risk on Yeah, on we're going to We're going to invest millions of dollars to produce this show. We're definitely going to own it. So we're kind of like, hmm, I don't know if we want to do that. Like give this away. Like it's work. It's. Like we're starting to feel purpose. We're starting to inspire our friends, which was really like the two things that we wanted was like to inspire our friends to do the things that we knew they really wanted to do but weren't and to feel some purpose and like have fun. And so we turned down the show. And Was anybody for it out of the four of you? Um, it was a... That's a tough... It's a really... It was, a, it was our most difficult decision. Uh, everyone around us was like, do the show. I mean, it's a pretty, it was like a no brainer. And the thing that miraculously works with Duncan, Dave, Johnny and I was, and is that we will disagree, but ultimately we will come to a consensus. And, and that's the way we've never done something where one person didn't want to do it. Mm. We've somehow aligned and, and everyone feels good about moving forward. And that's the decision that we all made. And, um, and and I had um, met someone in Mexico when I went, drove down with my parents who knew someone who is like this random connection to LA. And she watched the trailer that we had made. And she's like, you guys should think about doing this in the US if you're thinking about doing it in Canada. And I know a couple people in LA, you know, because everyone knows somebody in LA that works in entertainment. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I ended up flying down to LA on a buddy, on her buddy pass. So she gave me a free flight down to LA and she introduced me to some of her friends and um, you know everyone's like hey this is like I mean very LA hey yeah we want to do this this is awesome (laughs) right and so I come back from there I'm like guys I think this is like I think this is bigger than we think like and that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for us to say no yeah to because you knew there was other interests we just I just we just knew that like if we stayed the course Something's gonna, Something's gonna happen. We're gonna cont- and we had this dream of MTV in the states, like in MTV America. For us, you know, was the as big as we could go, right? Huge. I mean, at, the, at this time, totally. 2006, 2007. It was like the I Jackass mean, era too. Like it, yeah. it's like just after that, and and so we're like, fuck it, we're gonna we're gonna continue to do this on our own. And so we went back to school. And so, so the next, you, did you enroll back to school? Cause you, you left for a semester, right? Yeah. So we, yeah. So I then enrolled back in school. You're which feeling I, mentally better now because of everything you're experiencing. Yeah. And this is like, you know, and also started talking with the therapist. So started to understand this thing of why I was putting pressure on myself to make sure that I took breaks to make sure that like I had balance and all this stuff that, you know, just now I, I speak about a lot of this stuff, but we can get into that later about yeah. like how to actually you know, hopefully like keep that mental fitness and happiness and stuff like that. But yeah, I am now starting to definitely like feel better. Uh, and this is over, you know, an extended period of time. It takes yeah. slowly. And um, and so we all enroll back in school, which I end up, I end up dropping out pretty quickly because of starting to do trips down to LA and starting to hustle up uh, more sponsors and stuff like that. But anyways, like long story longer. We go back to school we're like we're gonna continue and just make our documentary on our own mm. we raise more money throughout the school year and end up raising a, a ridiculous amounts of money from sponsors in kind like like in kind and actual cash from sponsors levi's came on board wow palm pilot at the time you know they had like the pen with the yeah. phone they sponsored us and we bought a 1969 purple transit bus penelope I love that well, now the thing is, the difference is before you guys are pitching an idea. 
-hmm. Now it's, we've been doing this. We went out and did a two week road trip. We have video, we have a website, we have people back. Now people want to get invested because it's no longer this theoretical idea. This is like, we're actually doing it. Now it's happening. Yeah. And we're like, we're, we're going to make this documentary. We hired a film crew from LA, a director, two DPs, an audio guy. This is before MTV signs on you guys. Pre MTV. So this, this is, is all out of your guys' pocket. Now we've said, so this is, yes, this is like, we've said no to the Canadian TV show. Um, there might be something in the US, but we don't know. We're going to finish our documentary and make it on our own. And we raised money through these sponsors, paid the crew out of our pocket. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars that we raised <laughs> all to the crew, all to the bus, all to the visa so we can come down to the States, all to Anuntas, which in hindsight was a terrible <laughs> idea. We did not pay ourselves a thing. And then we're out of money and we're like, well, it's for the huh. experience. It's all for the experience. So we're like, so then we go on two months on the road, followed by a professional film crew, right? And we're making this documentary. So two months now we're in the States. We're going after bigger list items, singing the national anthem at an NBA game. You know, we're doing like things that we're crashing the VMAs, getting into the VMAs. We, uh, it's ridiculous. And then helping people in a major way. Like every, get, so every time you were still yeah, finding yeah. a way to Helping help. someone get a home. One from one. You know, rallying communities to come together. Riding bulls, you know, jumping out of planes. Uh, it, it, you, we're, we're just having a time. <laughs> having a time. I guess you could say it. So. And so we're like two months on the road. And again, all this magic happens. Yeah. And uh, we come back from that road trip and we're like, whoa, that was crazy crazy like let's make this documentary we now we got all this the footage let's fucking do it <laughs> and then we're like whoa it's pretty expensive to make a documentary like yeah. in post <laughs> yeah because you need somebody to go through all that edit it yeah licensing color sound and we had just spent all of our money and we're like oh fuck so i go back home and i start working in a bar <laughs> And I'm like pretty much like starting to feel depressed again. We've just turned down a TV show. We turned down our own TV show to make this documentary, which now we can't finish because it's now going to cost, God knows, another like 100K to finish. So we have all this footage that we can't even use. We can't even really tell people what we've been doing because how do you explain that? We wanted to show them. And... Um, uh, and then I start saving up enough money so I can start continuing to come down to LA. How tough is that though to go back to go back home and now you're I mean I'm not it's saying you're just working at a bar, but like to go from that extreme of traveling for two months with your oh, best no, friends. Oh no, don't make no mo no mistake. It sucked. It was like I was even a shitty bartender. <laughs> like I wasn't even good at that. Like I this was we felt like or I felt like I we had like flush this opportunity down the, t the toilet. You know, like we had a moment yeah. where we could have done a show where we, you know, somehow we botched that. And we somehow botched the, the, the opportunity to do a documentary. Um, and I, I actually got the timeline wrong because it was, I had met this person, this girl in Mexico, kind of in this time of turmoil. Mm. And that's when I started going down to LA. To LA. How and often so, are you going to LA? Is this like every couple months? You're just going there yeah, and network, like shake hands? and Yeah, I was like trying to, I would meet with people and I'd come back for follow-up. By yourself? Or by any, myself. None of the boys? No, because like it was just too expensive for us all to go. So um, Ben's like, I'll take it. I'll go to LA for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, so I was just, and, and that's when I dropped out of school to do this as things, you know. And then there started to be some interest. And so I would start doing these trips and uh, I started to stay down longer uh, I met a girl down in LA and I would stay with her and we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And so, you know, I would stay down for longer and ultimately figured out the business of TV down here by meeting with agents, meeting with production companies, and ultimately meeting with networks. So we ultimately partnered with a production company in LA and it was a production company that our agents, after we had finally got an agent, couldn't get us a meeting with. We had to find another way to get a meeting with them hmm. and partner with them, then pitch networks. And we, MTV and ABC were both interested, but MTV 
at the time had an amazing president who had been there for 18 years from like an intern all the way up to president wow. named Tony DeSanto. He immediately understood what we were doing. He got the ethos. Um, he s- said, I'm going to let you guys make this show. So our request to MTV was that we are executive producers. Uh, we hire our friends as the crew. We edit, choose the music. You guys can't help us. <laughs> wow. Which you guys went and swing it very, the yes. is very aggressive. And that's, you know, we had the, um, had been through the, the process at least the first time. So we sort of, you knew what you were walking into. We knew what we were walking into. We at least now had a track record of doing this for now two years, right? We had this footage. So we had an incredible pilot yeah. that we had shot. We made a full pilot on our own um, of, ironically crashing the vmas and getting in without them even knowing in matching women's suits that we got at a thrift store (laughs) right so uh and then paired that with helping someone so they saw the format so it was very easy for them to be like yes and it was the right time because they ultimately were shifting trying to shift their program into more aspirational stuff with janks with my life is liz which was the scripted show yeah it was more positive um and so they were like he's like okay Rock and roll. And so now we're packing up our bus in Victoria, driving down to LA to live, to make this show. And we're like, let's go. We're going to. And at this point, this is two years in on the project almost. Three now. This is three years. This is now 2009. So we started in 2006. That was our two week tour. 2007 was our two month tour. We ultimately took us about another two years to sell the show. Wow. Where like to actually like sell and move down to LA. So March two thousand nine, we move down. We get into pre production. We have no idea how to make. Are a you guys all living show. in on the bus? We're no. At that point, we're all <laughs> living in a share in a four bedroom apartment. Wow. <laughs> so we lived in a four bedroom apartment for two years, but we lived at the production studio. We slept in the edit base, just working, trying to put this Non-stop. together. We would shoot on, and then so the way the production schedule works for the most part in television is like you shoot on the road and you're sending tapes back to production. They're starting to cut, Mm -hmm. send rough cut to MTV, send fine cut to MTV. MTV sends back their notes and it's this process to get to the locked cut. And when it's locked, it's done. And everything's on a timeline because it's very expensive to keep production studios open and edit by avids and all this stuff. So we're on the road trying to give notes, trying to film and MTV is sort of locking the cuts and we're like, wait, this is awful. Like, we can't let this episode get out. Like, this is not <laughs> good enough. So we end up having, after we film, come back, pay an editor out of our own pocket to re-edit the episode, send it to the president of MTV, which is very not a good look, no. right? For your production company that no, you're working no, no, with, no, no. the executives that are giving the notes. And, yeah. You know, only the, the only two cuts maybe make it to the president right to sign off like the f- fine fine cut in the yeah, lock yeah. what so, was wrong with the cuts though was it just like they were not just the music cheesy. The direction, they were just yeah. like they weren't Too cookie cutter wasn't your style they just weren't like authentic yeah they weren't authentic and it was like felt like a reality tv show hmm. and bad music and you know and we were just so we sent him to and tony watched them and and he said yes this is the cut that we'll use mm. so then we started building rapport and with him and we re-edited the episodes and so we 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 were but doing it on our own time and so johnny would edit some of them we'd hire an editor we would we would be in the base for every edit um we'd choose all the music we'd like call the artist to get the licensing i mean we we for clearances we'd we'd make the clear we we okay in every other reality tv show this is generally how it works if there's a scene the uh, actors really yeah. will get the notes or at, the script or at least the end of sort of where they want you to get to in the scene and the director will direct you right so we we're like okay that's not happening we're gonna we're doing this for real <laughs> they're like okay okay we're like we're gonna for instance we said we're gonna break into the playboy mansion they're like producers are like okay this is the first episode we're gonna do Ever. We're gonna with, that, with br- MTV. Yes, with MTV. We're breaking in to the Playboy Mansion <laughs> during one of the big parties. They're like producers are like, okay, we're gonna call Playboy and clear it and let them know that we're gonna film and that you're gonna be coming. We're like, what are you talking about? 
no, no, no. We're going to break in to the Playboy Mansion. We'll ask them after. <laughs> They're like, that's not how it works because you can film this whole episode and you can break into the Playboy Mansion. But guess what? When you call and ask for permission to air this on TV and they say no, you just wasted it. Oh, because you need, you need them to give the thumbs up, right? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can't air an episode without the, the, the location release. Or, by the way, everybody that is on camera has to sign a release. What if they're blurred out? So you can blur it out. So we did that a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Your blur out budget must have been through. <laughs> you watch the show. There's a lot of blurs. So we're like, no. We're... If we're not breaking in for real, we're not, we're not doing breaking this. in. Yeah. What the hell is the point? Like, what's the point? Yeah. So they're like, okay, this is the first episode. We're going to do, we're going to give this one shot. Okay. So we're like, okay, we're going to break into Playboy Mansion. Everybody from the network and the production company comes down to, to watch basically from like two blocks away to see, because this is like, if this doesn't, this is the turning point, whether it's going our way or their way. Yeah. And they just are like, I actually just want to see what is going to happen. Are some of them in the party too? I feel like there had to have been maybe one or two. That we made- we had one, um, our line producer, who's female, she went in. She came, was the only one that bought a ticket. And the reason she did that is because we wanted to get footage inside. And so she... It was a it was called a Willy Wonka candy. It was called Candy Land Party. Yep. It was kind of like Willy Wonka themed, and I don't know what else. But basically, she had a tray of candy that she was kind of offering people. But really, because underneath the candy was a camera, mm. so she was hiding a camera in, underneath the candy, walking around, walking around. Footage. And she she was the only person that bought a ticket, right? Then the other the other strategy we had two strategies, one which I thought was so stupid, which was we're going to build a cake a prop cake that looks like the party and we're going to, uh, it's a Willy Wonka themed party. We're going to dress Duncan, Johnny and Dave, sorry, up as Willy Wonka themed, like Oompa Loompas, hide him in the bottom <laughs> of the cake, build a platform above them. So it's like a trap door where they can hide Yeah. and decorate the outside. So we, of what we thought I think it might look like inside the party, rent a Mack truck, make fake paperwork. Duncan will pretend to be the delivery guy. Put, them inside the cake inside the mac truck deliver the mac truck at 5 p.m the day of the party and say that we have a delivery for the playboy mansion uh and sort of how act. do you get the cake in though so that we didn't think of uh <laughs> well so first of all the guy's like well we don't have a and i'm forklift. hiding in you an need act- a forklift at I'm, that point i'm hiding in a car a block away filming in the back of a tinted like escalade just to see what happens because you're cristiano ronaldo right that was my thought i yeah. thought this was that my idea was way better it wasn't so he's in the back of this uh, so there are in <laughs> just picture like if you haven't seen this fucking episode it's so ridiculous they are they look like oompa loompas with the wigs and everything painted faces blue yeah or green or whatever um hiding in the bottom of this big cake that we decorated like just from a from fabric land with bottles so they can pee in with uh cameras that are like little camcorders that have night vision and they're filming and they're taping the tapes to the inside of the cake as they go through them and they're peeing in bottles and they have a couple beers and water (laughs) and at 5 p.m we roll the mac truck up to the back of the gate and um their security's like we don't have a anything on our delivery list for a cake and duncan's like well it says playboy on it so you know i gotta go pick up another cake so i gotta drop this off somewhere he's like well take the damn cake yeah he's like well will it melt and he's like no it's like a prop cake and she's like all right well just like can you wheel it in he's like yeah we wheel it in so she's like just like put it over there or something so out the back of this truck wheels this thing and he has another guy beside him and they and the back driveway is really steep and so and all the security are union so they actually can't help they can't touch it they can't touch it so they're standing there laughing as they're trying to push this 400 pound cake up this driveway it's just i see them like i'm like this is this is not good this is not good gets them up puts them in the side of the driveway and leaves them okay now we can't contact them. I can, we can't get through them on text. We yeah. don't know what's going on. 
They're just in that cake for six hours until, and they don't know where they are. Yeah. And they just hear music and they see lights go by every once in a while as the shuttle goes by. And finally at midnight, they're like, we got to get out of there. And they just decide to jump out of the cake. They run into the party. Dave sees Snoop Dogg on stage. He's like, I got about two minutes before we get kicked out of here. I'm going right on stage. Goes right on stage with Snoop Dogg. He's dancing with Snoop Dogg. And he looks at security. And then he sees security. And they kind of give him like the nod and the thumbs up. Wow. So and they he, thought he was almost like part of the whole party. They thought he was working the party. Because yeah. there's all these other Oompa Loompas that are working the party. He's just larger. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's like, oh my God, we got free reign. Wow. So then Johnny and... Dave have the best night of their lives. Are you and are you in there at this no, point? No, I you get oh, denied. You get denied at the door, right? I tried to get in as pretending I was Cristiano Ronaldo under this whole guise with like a website that we made from a fake Italian PR company. We were emailing with the promoter. We get stonewalled at the door. I'm signing, by the way, Cristiano Ronaldo photos at the gate to people <laughs> that think I'm Cristiano Ronaldo. Someone gets. I mean, it's just totally ridiculous. This person got in the car. We had this whole conversation, and I don't get in the party. Okay. Um, and we still don't know if Johnny and Dave are still like alive. <laughs> yeah, what happened to them? What happened? The cake got rolled in, but we don't know what happened. Yeah. After that. So they end up doing cannonballs into the grotto to Oompa Loompa chants, and they're sopping wet. They come back to the bus. We see them sopping wet. They're like, "We made it in," and that is like the one, like just to have done it. But two, the the weight of that moment because of what it meant for the show gave you guys the green light. Now you could do whatever. We could do you it want. our way. Yeah. And it changed the game. And so moving forward, everything was legit. Yeah. You know, whether it was streaking, whether it was surviving on a deserted island, we literally got blindfolded and pushed off a boat and just had to survive on an island in the Cook Islands. Um, we filmed it ourselves. You know, we had camera guys come from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. and then they had to leave. And it was like, we made the rules. Yeah. Um, but MTV was supportive through this entire process. You have the green light to create or do whatever you guys yep. think you want to do. Yep. Like, we would come to them with, with our list items. Um, we'd be like, we want to play basketball with the president. Yeah. And they'd be like... You're out of your mind. They're like, uh, we need an episode. <laughs> we're like, we're doing it. Yeah. You know? Uh, and we failed at stuff. Like, we tried to get Jay-Z to a house party. And we failed. But we ended up getting Naughty by, Naughty by Nature to do the badass party. Um, so, and then we insisted on having the the help stories every time, like helping someone cross something off their list. What was, is there any, any story that you helped that kind of stands out the most? You obviously the Brent one is the first one. That's just really important. I had seen doing the research. There was like this one, you had interviewed a woman who was dealing with cancer uh, mm -hmm. and how she was just talking about how much it's affected her life. Was there any other specific people you had helped along the way that that story still resonates or you still kind of remember the most? Yeah, t uh, yeah. There's a lot. Like um, one actually that I that I just is top of mind because she just reached out to me. Um, so it was a girl that, and you know, and this is like some of the things that I've been focusing around. My speaking is around mental health, so it's sort of top of mind. But she, we really wanted to do an episode that focused on um, mental health or like you know something like that. And so this girl wanted to. She struggled with self injury and and cutting and uh, so she wanted to make it okay to talk about what she was going through in her small town of uh it was rochester minnesota or something like that rochester maybe. new york maybe no it was no. uh it was it was in minnesota but uh uh anyways I'll, it'll come back to me but she her name's lexi and she uh so she wanted to um make it okay to talk about it. so we created this event with to write love in her arms which is a non-profit great non-profit for people that are struggling with um, you know, just about anything, yeah. but it's a, um, to this day, we're still close with the founder, Jamie and them. And we created this event in her hometown, uh, with music and Jamie speaking and, and I spoke and then she spoke about this and, um, it was just like a really s simple, but meaningful night. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she just messaged me last week and she said, uh, this is the 10 year anniversary, uh, of me being clean. Wow. Yeah. So she hasn't cut in 10 years. Wow. And so that was pretty cool just to have that come full circle. And, um, but lots of really cool, you know, moments like that. And that now have bubbled back up to the surface too, you know? And, yeah. Um, I mean, even, 
you know, to this day, still helping people cross things off their list. Like I did the commencement address at University of Utah yeah. last year, and I wanted to help someone connected to the university. And so there was a, um, a guy that was, um, he was a high school teacher and a high school basketball coach, loved basketball, retired, and then fell off his roof and tragically sustained a brain injury and forgot um, a lot of his memories, didn't know how to, to walk or talk or eat by himself when he first came back out of this coma. And ultimately through tenacity, perseverance, and working with the university um, spinal cord like injury clinic, yeah. learned how to walk, learned how to talk, uh, could go to the bathroom by himself, drove, can drive by himself. It really like defied the odds. Um, and, and, and when he lost his memory, he, he didn't lose his love of basketball, right? Like he, he just, he always, he remembered like all the names and the stats of the Utah jazz. And so with his daughter, we, I was like, we should, you know, we worked together to create a cool surprise for him around basketball. Cause he hadn't been to a game since his injury. And so we surprised him with, um, tickets to the jazz, his own Jersey, this really cool experience of meeting, you know, some of the players and just getting down to the court. And, uh, you know, that was just a, a really cool reminder of the power of pers persistence, you know? Yeah. And also just like how lucky we are with, without even knowing it, you know, just to have our health, yeah. you know, our well being. I mean, relatively injury free, I our know. legs, our sight, our s hearing. And so. There's a gentleman I see every morning in the gym, doesn't have, and he's missing one leg, but he's the hardest working person, I swear, in that gym every single day. And anytime that I, I go in, you know, into the gym that morning and maybe my mindset isn't there, it's it, if I see him, he's there almost every day that I'm there. It's mm -hmm. like immediately auto corrected because I'm just like, you have nothing to complain about, like at all, yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. in the simplest form yeah totally and i think it's it's uh you know the reason that we use death as a device to remind ourselves of the things that are important to us right that's why the, what do you want to do before you die is like really the one thing that made us think about what was important mm. um it's just like it just so happens that it's usually death or a close brush with death that makes us realize how lucky we are. Mm. And it's, 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 it's really, it's a shame that it takes that type of tragedy or near death experience to make us sometimes truly value the importance of just breathing, yeah. you know, and how lucky we are and how grateful we should be just to be here. So like, how can we give ourselves that reminder that we are going to die without having to go through that because mm -hmm. that isn't a, a you know nobody should nobody have to go, to go through, through that. that but we need that reminder so like what can you do to remind yourself that your time is limited and that you can do the things that you want to do uh and that's why you know i think reminding yourself that you are going to die and also anything you can do to remind yourself about the things that are important to you which is yeah. why the list Again, we fell into this idea of a bucket list, but ultimately it's super powerful because it's a reminder of the most important things to do to you in your life, right? Like if you write your list properly, take the time to think about what's going to give you the most joy, happiness, fulfillment, then the list itself, that's just a reminder that those things exist. Because if you don't have something to remind yourself, they get buried, Yeah. right? That's why the poem, The Buried Life was written 150 years ago. This is not a new feeling. This has been happening for hundreds of years. This is a human condition. The things that you truly want, they ultimately get pushed till tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow because there's no deadlines for those things. And we have deadlines for all of other shit. So you push them, you push them, you push them. If you don't have a reminder, they continually get buried Yeah. until you get to the end of your life and you look back and you're like, fuck. Yeah. Where'd the time go? And that is actually backed by research. There's a new study that came out by this guy, Tom Gilovich, who's a psychologist out of Cornell. And this is like a game changer when I read this. And he basically did six academic studies. He wrote one paper called The Ideal Road Not Taken in the Journal Emotion. And he found that people at the end of their life don't regret the things they did. They regret the things they didn't do. 
Hmm. And when he asked people dying, people on their deathbed, and this is, tr- you'll read um, books by hospice workers and it's consistent, right? The number one regret that people have at the end of their life, 76% of people feel this way, is not living my ideal self. So not living the life that I wanted, living the life that other people wanted for me Mm. or the life that I think other people want for me. 76% of people die with that regret, not being themselves. That is so fucked. Like that, no one should feel like that. So I hope that more people get into the 24%, right? Which is the minority of people getting to the end of life feeling, yeah, content. I did it. I feel like I did the thing that I needed to do or the little things that I need to do. By the way, it doesn't mean that you have to make your living doing those things, right? You just need to take time and prioritize that time and and, and do the small things that are important to you so that when you consult your future self down the road, like think about yourself on your deathbed, that's an easy way to make decisions when you are at a crossroads. Will my future self regret not doing this? If yes, you have to do it, Yeah. right? And so any way you can kind of remind yourself of that future self and have reminders of the things that are important to you, like your list or an accountability buddy that yeah. checks in on you, right? Yeah. That increases your odds. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a reminder on your phone. Maybe it's a group of friends that get together to do something together or to talk about the things that you want to do. And like any accountability that you can imp- start to impose, to get self-imposed deadlines around those personal goals so you don't end up at the end of your life looking back with regret is super important, you know? And that's kind of the sole purpose of why I, I've been speaking is because when I learned that from that study, I was like, wow, that's heartbreaking. And in that, I don't think that needs to be the case. And I think that throughout these crazy adventures, there's been these things that I've actually learned that I believe are really important about life. And we fell into it as kids. Like we didn't have this grandmaster plan. Um, we just stumbled our way through it. But looking back, it's like we got really lucky yeah. with a couple of these deep, deeper philosophies around, you know, thinking about your life as being finite, reminding yourself that your goals, your personal goals are important and exist through either a list or friends to keep yeah. you accountable. And ultimately, the thing that we didn't understand when we started Barry Life that now I know is just like a pillar of truth is, as I said, when we started, I thought that going after a bucket list was selfish. So we didn't really tell people. But then people were inspired to do their list just by the fact that we were doing our list. Yeah. And all these kids around the country were starting to go after their list through the show. And I was like, holy shit. You, by doing what you love, you inspire other people to do what they love. And that ripple effect goes so far. Like, yeah. You'll never know that impact. It's like Lewis's ripple effect with you from his podcast is the impact you're having by your podcast and the impact that you have for kids listening to your podcast, the impact they'll have, you can draw that back to Lewis. You can draw Lewis's, you know, his inspiration to start his podcast probably back to someone else. Yeah. Maybe whether it's Tim Ferriss or maybe it's a friend. And so the person that in, I can draw buried life back to the kid that started the clothing line in high school. Yeah. That clothing line doesn't exist anymore. I don't even know if it was successful. It doesn't matter. The impact that had was me calling Johnny, starting the buried life. The impact the buried life had, you know, continues to have is like the Yes Theory Boys. And yeah. People like myself. And so the impact that they've had. Yeah. So you talk about this huge scope of impact from one kid that started a clothing line that proves that one person can make a massive impact you know what's crazy lewis was the one that inspired me right to Mm -hmm. start a podcast but then i was like okay i need to have people around me that are passionate and one of the buddies that i grew up with in high school number two on the podcast started his own clothing line now lives out here in la and has his own studio in downtown la so the same as you're like going through it just like I could feel that it, it was him. It was my buddy Dylan that I introduced you to. He was making music. 
uh, Nathan was making clothes. Another buddy was shooting photos. These guys at small, small, small scale were doing the thing they love, but it was so inspiring to me because they were waking up and they were so driven. They were so driven. They were sober. They were just focused on their thing. They were the outcasts, the outliers of like, oh, these guys are trying to create and do this thing, and now they're all living full time off of their passion. Mm-hmm. And I even got, if you can look to your right, I got Lewis's DM right there. And when I had DM'd them one time, just saying like, you inspired me, you know, X, Y, and Z, and it's just a constant reminder for me because it's like I'm now. What is so mind blowing to me is people like yourself. I'm, I'm, I've even just casually just talked to him through the DM once or twice before, and it's just so crazy to me because this all stems back to just the unknown. When you got just like you guys are talking about today, just you have this list and you're just gonna go for it. I had this podcast, I'm just gonna go for it, and it it is amazing feeling that I can't even express to people to listen. It really, it's it's through guests that come on and tell their story that they get to hear, but it's like the only thing that separates people from where they are today and the life that they dream of living is just by action of doing. You mm-hmm. don't have to have the perfect blueprint. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to be the master of a craft. I'm not, I tell people all the time, I joke around, I, I, I claim to be the world's favorite podcast or the world's favorite bearded man, the world's favorite Uber driver. But at the end of the day, I'm just a normal human being. I love mm-hmm. people and it's like, if there's anything I've realized, it's if you really are willing to work hard and put put yourself in a position to succeed and, 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 and throw yourself out there and make the necessary sacrifices, the world will full circle and, and, and bring it right back to you, mm-hmm. bring it right back to you. Why does I'm I'm really curious. You guys end up doing two seasons of mm. MTV. Yep. What? Why stop? What was the decision? Because for something that's creating so much good energy, so much positivity for the world, what what ends up being the deciding factor to stop the show? Well, we realized that the format that we had created was um, it just wasn't scalable because every time we would do something new, we had to one up what we had done before. Um, and so we started to realize that we couldn't keep doing that. Um, and also think back to 2011, that was when Jersey Shore popped. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden Jersey Shore rocketed into the ratings. Um, they were so to, like perspective, like back then, if you get like a million um uh rating of a million viewers it's like it's pretty solid and when they say million that's within that when it when it premieres yeah exactly so like yeah when it premieres like a million people watch a million to million five like it's pretty good yeah jersey shore was getting like eight million and so all of a sudden it was and also teen mom was starting to get like four and so the ratings just didn't stack up so we were at this point where the ratings we had to hit were just next to impossible for us unless we were doing the most ridiculous things and we couldn't keep doing the most ridiculous things. So it was just, it kind of was business had it, had its run. Yeah. yeah. And then we were focused on the book and we did speaking together and then we started a production company and we did Theos. Is so, that the name of it? Yeah. Theos. We did some like, uh, shows we did one with rory kramer on yeah, mtv yep. dare to live we got rory past guests one, right 110 on. look at him look at 110 he looks like he's standing for a mug shot almost <laughs> <laughs> rory. oh i didn't realize you guys actually had did did that show with him yeah we created it with him wow yep um, wow so that was a fun one because it was very like much you know had the same dna yeah Definitely uh, same DNA. He could have been yeah. the fifth member of the squad yeah, for you totally. guys. He definitely would have fit right on in. Yeah, that was cool because we, yeah, that's, that was really fun. And we did a couple other shows with MTV that we produced. Um, and then I started doing more speaking. Mm. And uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was a, it was just kind of the evolution, Yeah, you know. And now we... Our big focus is finishing the documentary. Nine items, right? Is there yeah, nine? nine items left on the list of 100. You so got we're at 91 of 100. You got but, Dancing with Ellen, yep. host Saturday, uh, Saturday Night Live, <laughs> go to space. A couple easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> let's check that off the bucket list. Hey, Ellen's right down the road in Burbank. Oh, let's let's go knock on her door. Yeah. Oh, we tried that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we do, yeah, we have Lewis, nine. Call Lewis. He, he's been on LA a couple know, times. I know, I know. Lewis Howes, get him on the day. What we'll show. do, what I'm thinking, 
once the doc comes out, that's our. I think that's all. So you don't need you don't need to cross off the rest of the items to finish no. the doc. Okay. No, like doc is just talking about. I mean, you have enough to talk about. Yeah, like so, the what we want to do with the documentary is. So the the ripple effect that I told you about. Yeah. Um, it's amazing when you describe it like that because it is kind of crazy. To think about. Yeah. So when doc connects, somebody's gonna hear this three four years from now is gonna hit you up and say I heard you on that podcast. It's yeah. It's exactly. weird. Exactly. You just never know. So you. So you can have this really incredible impact by doing what you love, which is sort of a crazy win-win. It's like, whoa, you know, you can do your thing and help, yeah, right, and give back. So that's should be hopefully enough to encourage people to do their thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not selfish; it's actually service, mm. right? Um, you know, you can't even be there for anyone else if you don't take care of yourself. So. This is one way to take care of yourself is by prioritizing the things that you believe are important. Mm -hmm. So you can't, that's why flight attendants say in case of emergency, put on your own oxygen mask before helping others Mm -hmm. because you can't help someone else if you can't breathe. Yeah. (laughs) So all this stuff is about giving people permission to really do the things that are going to make them happy. Mm. And, uh, and, and sort of like remove the idea that you um, that it's selfish to do that or, or any type of this stuff, this stuff is selfish. So so the doc, you know, is next about year, the, right? is, is, we, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it's about year. the ripple effect. And um, and so we want to do the the biggest thing on the list, which is go to space. Number 100 to create the biggest ripple. Like we want this documentary to create the biggest ripple effect of all time so that people in 10, 20 30 years can watch it and get that hit of that feeling, you know, that we felt when we were first on the road, that magic that started to happen that happens when you do what you love and do the thing that they love and hopefully compound the ripple effect. So, Mm -hmm. so the one thing that we're actively going after is go to space. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, I just, yesterday I was speaking in New Orleans and I met five people that work at NASA. You know, it's crazy because we spoke yesterday. Yeah. Not even 15 minutes later, guess where I was? Where? Pasadena at the NASA station. Really? I was picking somebody up. And so me, I'm like, when I get the pickup for the Uber to go to NASA, I'm like red light. I'm like, okay, I just got the phone with Ben. Let me see what I can get. Can I get somebody for him? And I end up getting this woman. She gets in the car. I just like kind of try to pry at her like, oh, what do you do here? Like, what's what's going on? And she she does a lot of like the office work for yeah. some of the scientists, but it was it was just so serendipity That's of like crazy. I just got off the phone talking about NASA with Ben, and now I'm literally at the NASA place in Pasadena. That's but, wild. But continue on, please. Yeah. So you so, met you met four or five people yesterday. Yeah, just that, that that work at NASA, and so that will be a good conduit there. I mean, we're sort of exploring all avenues with Elon or Bezos or NASA or Red Bull, and you know anyone that's Lockheed Martin sort of have lines out to try and pursue all of these things to see how we can do something uh within the next because most of these companies are is doing commercial space flight in like two years so and then there's a five-year waiting list so wow it's uh so we're trying to figure out a quicker way can can so. you say what the vision is so i can cut this clip when it happens and i can say <laughs> look what i got three years ago totally yeah i mean the vision is getting one of us up do you know who of the four? Probably Dave. <laughs> probably Dave. <laughs> um, and ultimately, you know what would be the dream? And we've been talking with this about, we've been talking about this with them is doing something with the Yes Theory guys because they were inspired by Barry Life in part and just to prove the ripple effect. Yeah. You know, to, to come together with them and do something with them in some way, shape or form would be really cool. So um, they send you guys into space. They flick the they flick the match. Dave yeah, goes up. Dave goes up, or you know, one of bring each. up Matt or somebody up there with them. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So that's you know we're chipping away at that, and I you know that is my like over before I die that doc will be made. Um, and so that's kind of what I, what I've been working on and doing along with the speaking and writing some more stuff mm. around like uh, another book and. And so the, yeah, the journey continues. Yeah. How amazing is it that you guys end up creating a New York Times bestseller? Yeah. I mean, that's not, that's not a light. <laughs> Let's not glaze over that. Like, what do you want to do before you die and ends up becoming a New York Times bestseller? And you guys just republished it back in May. What was that all about? 
Yeah, so we it had been in print for a number of years yeah. and we just did a new edition which was like we added some content to it and we we I mean effectively made it so that it's now timeless in the sense that like it could in 20 years someone could pick it up mm. and uh it would still be relevant. So, yeah, that book's cool cuz it was you know, talk about this idea of a ripple and you just don't know where that's going to come from, like where that tr spark of inspiration is going to come from. It could come from someone you know, it could come from someone you read, it could be something that you don't know. And so the the idea for the book is let's gather all the answers. So we, people send have been sending us their dreams for years. And so we collected the 200 most moving dreams mm. whether they they made a, they made us feel something in some way shape or form made us laugh made us you know think uh, moved us in some way and then we got artists to illustrate those dreams and we put them in a book and we put quotes in our story and through it so so yes yeah, so that's the that's what you want to do before you die and uh, uh that may have been our biggest <laughs> before guys that including one that barely passed english to get a number one <laughs> new york times bestseller is <laughs> I don't think should happen. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. New York Times bestseller. I mean, when that, when this, when the doc rolls out, whenever that happens and you guys shoot up into space and, and it's kind of ready to, to change over the chapter and kind of close the buried life, what, what's the big takeaway from it all? What do you think this resembles? I think. I think it comes down to this idea that you do what you love and you inspire other people to do what they love. Mm. And uh, again, as I said, it doesn't mean that you have to make your living off of it, um, but make sure that you carve out time and prioritize that time to do those things that you know that you love because you don't want to end up at the end of your life looking back and thinking, damn, I really messed that one up. Do you have any regret from the since the start of Barry Life or any sacrifices that you kind of think back on? Uh, good question. I don't know. I don't... Th oh, you know what? Like, we could... I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like when we were starting it, we, it was right when the bucket list film came out and we, it came out like a year or two after we started Buried Life. That's with, um, um, Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman, and Jack Nicholson. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're like, they took our idea <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, the bucket list is cheesy. Like we're like, we'll never use the word bucket list. Yeah. Right. We're like, we're going to use list. The, <laughs> the list. And anytime anyone would try and talk about bucket list, we'd be like, no, 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 no. It's the list. It's the list. And I think if we would have just gotten over ourselves and embraced the bucket list, like that became, you know, and is like the thing that people attach it to. And so now I'm like very much, I don't care what like you call it. It's more about the definition of what it is, mm. right? Like if you define a bucket list property, as I said, it's just like the list of the most important things to you in your life. And I think if we would have just embraced the bucket list, then, you know, maybe it would have even been bigger or maybe it wouldn't, people would have attached to it easier because it would have been this thing that they you know intuitively would be like oh i understand and i think that people still did that anyways mm. so we could have just been like yeah we're the bucket list guys yeah <laughs> but we're like nah, nah. that's brutal we're the, oh, no. we're the list guys yeah so outside of berry life is there a certain bucket list item in your life that you you want to cross off anything up top yeah um i want to have a family mm. i Recently crossed off by a house, and we got actually, I got engaged, so that was a big one. Congratulations, yep. Thank you. Big. So we're gonna, I'm going to get married. That's amazing. Thank you. And so that's been on the list for a while. In fact, Fall in Love is on the list, number 78, so I feel- And there you go. That's that officially off. off. Yep. And- uh, and You're not doing the get married in Vegas part, right? You're not no, going to cross that. Dave I mean, already did that. Dave already did that. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and so- I would I would really like to write my next like piece, you know. I, I, we wrote the last book as a group, and so uh, as I speak more and more, it's 
uh, clear to me that this is something that's like resonating with people. But I don't have anything that represents what I'm talking about, really, like the ripple effect and, you know, a lot of these things that we've touched on, the pieces around mental health. So I really want like a token to like leave behind, and give mm. people and stuff like that. So that would be next on the list for me is like some sort of thing that like a Ben Nempton piece. Yep. And then, uh, yeah. And, and then continue. And then this doc, you know, is, is like, uh, is like the piece de resistance. Mm. <laughs> it's like, it has to happen. Yeah. It has to happen. But like now that we have a pathway to, I can see how we're for a long time. It was like, go to space. Okay, great. Like how, <laughs> fuck <laughs> i think that's about as far as we got <laughs> you know but now it's like we're talking with people and now i see how it's gonna happen like there's avenues where in like the next like six to 12 months this could happen it's like okay it's gonna be expensive yeah. <laughs> so now i gotta like raise some money but yeah. at least we i can the conversations flow how it's going to happen so that's really exciting and then um yeah and then uh, i guess family yeah yeah, the speaking though you've you spoke in front of Amazon, Microsoft. You've done TEDx talks. We talked about the commencement speech at the University of Utah. Uh, some of the topics you've covered are the five steps five steps to make the impossible possible, the new leadership, why you matter, um, and then mental wealth. What what practices or like rituals are you doing to get in the zone before you hit the stage? Because this is a whole another chapter of Ben now, right? Like the, the TV spotlight, obviously, I feel like that's giving you that energy when it's time to be on camera, you're ready to go. Now we're in, I'm speaking in front of a crowd. This is much more structured. Yep. What's the thought process when you go into something like that? Good question. So like I uh, will try and get eight hours of sleep. Yeah. Uh, there's a great... Um, book called why we sleep i may be getting that wrong um, but it's about how sleep is not a pillar of wellness but the foundation of which all pillars rest on so mm. can, the most important thing you can do for your well-being period full stop so um the simple an anecdote from that is we all know those people maybe we are those people that are like Oh, I just don't need eight hours of sleep. I'm good with six. I'm good with seven. Six. Yeah. I know so, it's not good, but you got to hustle and grind. Yeah, no, totally. But like, so he, he's he been studying sleep for 20 years. He said the percentage of the population that can do under eight hours of sleep and not see detrimental effects to their health, the percentage of the population rounded to a whole number is zero. So under half a percent. So okay. you can do it, but you're it's having an adverse effect on your well-being or your memory or a myriad of different things. It's a fascinating book. And I know the difference. I can feel the eight to six, but it's more of like, I know I can make you it can, work. Of course, yes. But I know long play, big picture, it shouldn't be that yeah. type of grind. That type but sometimes, of you ha sometimes you have to do it as long as you are aware that sometimes you really got to prioritize that. I sleep. think what, what, what you can counter is eating right, yep. feeling yourself the right liquids, meditating, Meditation is every, great. everything else. I make sure it's there, but sometimes yeah. the sleep. I yeah, I've been there. And so sleep, try and get eight hours, but can't always do it because of travel and stuff like that. Um, wake up, some sort of exercise, like usually push-ups till exhaustion. It's like, the, like just like that's, <laughs> you know, even long. five minutes, just yeah. like some exercise, uh, hot, cold shower. So that like wakes up your body. Mm-hmm. Hopefully you got the blood moving because of the exercise. Mm -hmm. And then always I meditate for 20 minutes with uh, doing TM, mm. Transcendental Meditation, which was something that I learned actually many years ago from my parents who also practiced TM, which I was just lucky that they were like, you have to learn how to do this when I was like 19. So Was that through the process, not to cut you off? Was that when you were going through the whole thing with the rugby? Yeah, that it help was. Or it, it kind of glazed no, over that at at the at that time i was like screw meditation like i was like 19 i was like i don't even okay i'll learn how to do it but i didn't practice yeah. it i was just like this is for crazy people <laughs> you know like Sit and, and listen to my breath what are you talking yeah, about yeah and like everyone that i knew that did it were weird and yeah you know so i was 19 i was like i'm not gonna meditate yeah <laughs> and now i was just glad that i learned it at that age because now i do so that I would say is the most important for me because I can have not slept a wink before. You know, sometimes you just have sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, shit, there's like, I'm speaking in front of 5,000 people tomorrow. I cannot not sleep. But if I meditate, I'm okay for that 
talk. Like I'm not a hundred percent, but I'm I can get you up can to make like it work. 85, 90%. So I always meditate and then I do a coffee before I speak and I put in some MCT oil. Yep. Which is what you saw me put in. I also put in um this herbal um it's it's kind of like an Ayur, ayurvedic uh ghee kind of like botanicals and ghee mm. so it's like if you know bulletproof coffee and you put butter and coffee and you whip it up uh, sometimes you, instead of butter you use ghee because it's like cleaner and this company called hana it's called hana one is like it mixes ghee with these botanicals and it has this like travel pack right because i have to travel with it and then i add uh, some of Laird's superfood creamer. So Laird Hamilton, big wave surfer, mm. he created this coconut based creamer that has a bunch of superfoods in it. And you can put a dollop of that. Sometimes it has like cacao in it or whatever. So I make this little like witch's brew coffee that for me just like gets me mentally stimulated. And um, something about the Hana one like makes me feel also calm because mm. it's kind of like grounding in a way. It's sort of hard to explain but it's a cool it changes the taste of the coffee for sure it's like it's a it's a pretty strong you can feel the different when you put it in there you can feel but yeah like so i like this kind of so you know that's what i use but i think that some people are like i don't want to drink coffee before i I talk because it makes me too jittery jittery which is totally cool so it's like whatever but i think the mixture of exercise hot cold shower and meditation like gets your body going in all the right ways and then calms you Mm. i feel so that is so that so that's the routine i do every time and um without fail Mm. and if i can only do one i meditate Hmm. and then uh you know off you go then try and have fun and you know if you get nervous it's crazy i wouldn't say it's crazy i actually understand because i've been doing it so public speaking is the is people's number one fear like it's uh the greatest fear people have above death is speaking in front of a crowd so jerry seinfeld has this bit it was famous you probably know he's like you know people at a funeral people would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy right (laughs) so this is crazy but it's true so like you know the other things that i do to help calm myself down like the commencement address was i was freaked out because it was like a way bigger deal than I expected because <laughs> being from Canada, I didn't know that commencement addresses at these big schools were like a big thing. Deal. Yeah, yeah. So it was like 10,000 people and it was a huge procession in the stadium and I was in the rehearsal. I was so nervous my leg was shaking. Like uncontrollably. Uncontrollably. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot have my leg shaking when I'm doing the commencement. All the most important people are behind me. Mm. So my leg shaking the whole time it's gonna be bad Mm. like it'll like i'm screwed basically so there was like the first time where i was i was at a point where uh it was like that black and white you know like so if i'm speaking and i forget something i can improvise i can go on to the next thing if i trip do you have like cards at all when you're you're speaking or no i don't have cards but i have slot you know it's 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 very visual so there's lots of photos and videos and you know where to pick up certain subjects yeah yeah and so you know, there's always that. I always know that I could, I'll be okay. Even if I fall, I'll get up, make a joke about it, whatever. But this was like, if I can't stop my leg from shaking, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> I'm like, oh, Lord. That's so, not going to be good. So I was, uh, so I, I, I talked uh, with someone who I trust, who like when I, you know, it, when I need help, I'll call, you know, just like someone who's just very sound with her advice and stuff like that. And uh, I was like, what do I do? And so anyways, point being, in terms of things that you can do to stop yourself from being nervous, if you're public speaking, this is what I did and this helped. So one is remind yourself why you are doing, why you are speaking. What are you there to do? Mm. Okay, so in the purposes of this example, I was there to hopefully help motivate or inspire or change some student's life in this next phase. Yeah. Like that's why I was there. It's a big I wasn't, day for people. It's a big day, and uh, it's not really my day. No. <laughs> it's, a, it's not really about me at all. This is about them, right? Like I'm not there for any other reason. I was chosen to inspire them. So if that's the case, then it's not really about me. Therefore, I don't really have anything to be nervous about because it's not about me. Yeah. So 
most of the time when you speak, it's not about you. It's about the the people that you're speaking to. So focus on them and remind yourself that that's what this is about. Second is if you phys- if you take in the physical environment of the space, that also helps. Because what you're trying to do is take yourself out of your head and into your body or just simply out of your head. So by actually focusing on the room, the chairs, the lights. Being present. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, yeah, you, yeah. Ground, you start to ground yourself. Yeah. Um, you also, a good thing that really helped for me was to get out of my head is to do body scans. So like throughout the full day leading up, I would do body scans. So I just sit and I just be like, okay, how are my toes doing? <laughs> Let's move up from mm. the ankles, knees, and just like notice your body all the way up to your head and just do that. And that just practices you, you get out of your head. You're just like into your more physical body. You're sitting on a chair. How does that feel? So what I was worried about is I was sitting behind the, 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 the podium mm-hmm. for like two hours before I spoke. And I was like, that's going to fuel my nervousness. Mm-hmm. And so while I was sitting there, I just would do body scans. And, and then the, the biggest thing, this is the most difficult, but it is, the thing that I think is the most important is like, have fun. Like if you're, you know, if you're not up there having fun, you know, what's the point? And again, it's an easy thing to say. It's hard to, harder to embody, but I was just like, fuck it. Like what, like I'm here, I've done the work I can do to prepare. I may as well have fun. And that really calmed me down that all those things. And, and I was, uh, I was actually, I actually yawned a couple times before I went up and I was like, oh no, I think I've gone too far. <laughs> get the blood phone, get the blood phone. So I need the coffee. Yeah. So that was, uh, but those, but the other thing that, that really helps is just repetition, right? Yeah. Like exposure therapy is the best way to get better as at anything, but definitely public speaking. The more you do it, just like a muscle, you grow, build that muscle. Like if I don't speak for, like say a month you know you feel a little shaky right going i come into back it. and i'm like i lost it yeah. i think right before i'm like whoa wh- yeah, yeah. I, and then you're like no 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 you didn't yeah <laughs> you yep. think you do and you get back and you get back in the rhythm and then you're fine yeah so it is like i've no friends that are speakers that if they don't speak for over uh, two weeks they'll go to a stand-up show and just get killed on the open mic just to be out on front of yeah people on stage people you know and so that is you know, and you know, Tim Ferriss has a great podcast um, where he where he's talking about public speaking, and he's uh, uh, he's with the author of Quiet, I think, is it, the book about introverts, and they're talking about preparing for a TED talk. And so, Toastmasters actually is a good program. I've heard, I've never done it, but mm. he talks about that. Is uh, and then, but really, it's expo- You know, it's just just put yourself into as close to a simulation as you can to what you were about to do. Mm. So if you're going to go speak in front of 50 people, speak in front of groups of 20 people, 10 people, like in environments that you don't know the people, just Mm. that you, what you want, you don't necessarily, you want to get comfortable with the material, but you really want to get comfortable with that uncomfortableness Mm. because that is the muscle that you're building. And that's ultimately what you're going to feel every time. But you know that that's never going to go away. You're just going to get comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, and you just get more comfortable with sort of like the actual art of speaking as well. So that, you know, those things tend to help. And I think that's that that's what I love about Yes Theory is how they keep pushing that whole seek discomfort because that uncomfortability is that ends up becoming kind of where we really start to find our true selves, our true happiness like that chasing after the thing that makes us the most un- uncomfortable. I feel like you probably even to a certain extent, you get a probably a little nervous going into any 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 opportunity to speak, but then once you're rolling, you're good to go. Even this, like I always get anxious before guests get here because I just I put so much pressure on myself that I want to make sure it's something that they remember and it's not a waste of their time, but as soon as the mics are going, autopilot. I'm yeah. I'm just bliss. Yeah. And I it's the same thing when I go two or three weeks without a podcast, I'm like scratching my neck. I'm like, it's like a drug. It's like, yo, I need to get somebody in here. Am I gonna forget how to run the show? Like what's gonna go wrong? But yeah. I think I think uh it's that consistency of just doing something over and over and over. That's when you start to just build the muscles and you start to to be more comfortable doing the thing. Yep. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. they've been ta- thinking about it uh, as this like sort of next phase with like the next piece of whether it's like an audio book or a book and and podcast and uh, um, yeah, I think I think that it's it's something that I would I would love to do and just kind of figure out when and where. Yeah, yeah, I think you would crush it. Thank you, man. Either interviewing or you know, so like another Tim Ferriss type pod because you know he does sometimes he does solo pods. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's so much that you could talk about within just certain topics that kind of spark your interest. You could talk about whatever, but then also just the people you're surrounded by those conversations like we're doing today would be extreme, extremely insightful and valuable to people like me would, would kill to listen to a podcast like that. So I feel like at some point you would, uh, you would absolutely murder that. Thank you. Why, uh, if somebody, you know, is looking to book 10 different speakers, right? Or they have a, one position and they're looking at 10 of them, 10 different speakers to possibly come for this one slot. Why should people hire you? I think that they are ultimately gravitating towards like real speakers. Mm. I think that um, that authenticity is the most important thing. And uh, and, then, and along with that, like good, good, good message and story, obviously. But like, I, I think that, you know, if you can be yourself first and foremost, that is was what's going to connect with the people sitting in those chairs. And so I try and do that. Yeah. And I think the authenticity, once you can, when, when you can actually just be your so complete self, it is the best feeling in the world because you're so unapologetically yourself that nothing matters. Nobody, nobody's opinions, whether you hiccup and you and you you make a mistake on stage and you laugh about it and you keep going, it's just like it doesn't matter because you're just you're so much yourself that it, it's almost like the end of Eight Mile, the movie with Eminem, where yep. he like literally calls out every diss on himself, and then the guy has nothing else to say because he's like <laughs> he just called himself out on everything, you yeah. know. So it's just like when you are so comfortable in your own skin, which it's it's a gift, right? And it, I think some of us are fortunate we can find that uh, that balance of like trusting that it's okay to be who I am. But also reminding those out there that like you can just accept who you are and know mm-hmm. that everybody has their strengths, everybody has their weaknesses. But what do you, you just have to make best of who you are and just speak the world. Yep. Who that person might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Couldn't agree more. Yeah. What? Uh, I'm curious. You're 35 years young today, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm 25 years mm-hmm. young. If you were sitting across from the 25 year young version of yourself, what's the advice you would give them? Sitting across from twenty five year old me, yeah, I it would it would be like I mean again, it's hitting on the same themes and it's cliche, but it's true. Uh, it's just like keep following the the things that give you energy, you mm-hmm. know, uh, because there's a time when I was so focused on succeeding at the production company that we had started, you know, and ultimately I'm not as involved anymore that I thought this is the this is the right trajectory for us and for me, right? Is to like now let's make shows like the one that we did and continue and build a successful production company. But ultimately after years of grinding, it's just like I just was not happy. I just didn't you know, it was not what I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, the work was different. It wasn't creative. I wasn't working with people that I love to work with. You know, not the guys but the actual networks and production partners and blah 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 blah. And so I was, you know, after three years of that, of just like, it was working, but it was fucking hard. Yeah. I was like, "Ah, I'm out. Like, I just, I can't do this anymore. And I shifted into speaking. And then it was just like the ease that came from that of like, you know, following that, um, of, of that thing that just is, comes easy, you know, like for me to speak, I love to do it. It's easy for me. And uh, it seems to make an impact. And so, you that those are the roads you want to follow like not what you think you should be doing but find that thing that like you can do better than other people that just comes it's almost like you almost feel bad that you're getting paid for it because mm-hmm. you're just it's so easy you would for do you. it even if it, even if the money yeah. wasn't involved you know that's the that would be the dream um but i feel really lucky that i think i found that for this you know next phase and i think i could have got there a lot quicker after like 25 would probably just been about the time when, you know, the show and the book and well, it's probably like, you know, right after the show. And I would have just been, instead of like putting all your pressure on yourself to do what you think you should do after like 
you know, now what's next after the show and the book? Mm. It's just like, that doesn't matter. What, what do you want to do? Yeah. What scares you the most? Um, you know, I think, I think I've still get caught up about failure or what the, what's below that, which is like what other people think. Like I'm a perfectionist and I think a lot of that's driven by what I think other people think. And I, I think that if I could let go of just that, I would be, I would worry about less stuff, you know? I think it's a double-edged sword because I, I believe that's also what drives has gotten me to where I am is that perfectionism. Yeah. But there comes a point where you just got to let go. Yeah. And I worry about too much stuff. And I think that I want to, my goal is to not have any sleepless nights because I'm worried about something, you know, like I, I don't ever want to worry about something so much that I am not able to sleep. And I think I'm getting better at that, but like, that's success. Yeah. <laughs> it's like being able to sleep soundly. I mean, some people can just knock out and they'll sleep no matter what. 30 seconds. <laughs> That's great. You, uh, <laughs> Most times. You, you, I know. <laughs> you are, you should be thanking the Lord <laughs> every day. So yeah. like me, it's, it's uh, things will keep me up at night. Yeah. And if I can't sleep, it's not good. Like I'll get, you know, then I'm, I can't function. And so, so yeah, so that would be the, the, that if I could let go of that, that's because that stuff obviously like it eats me up. Yeah. And we, and we, we really kind of got through it quickly yeah. in the beginning of the podcast, but that kind of stems back to the environment you were raised in. But both of your parents, they were yeah. self employed. Yeah. They weren't really putting too much pressure on you. Um, why, one, why do you think this whole from the beginning has become this perfectionist? And then, secondly, off of that, what do you think was one of the greatest lessons that they taught you that you still carry with you? Yeah, I think the perfectionism came from like I had this moment when I was in elementary school when all my friends ran away from me and they kind of like ditched me, you know, mm. and they would do that during the recess like for a number of weeks. And all of a sudden I just had no friends. And I think it, that that was just so hard, right? Like you're grade five and it's just like, what do you, you know, you don't know what to do. And so at that point I was like, okay, I never want that to happen to happen therefore i want people to like me Mm -hmm. and i think that's where this idea that i had to be you know make everyone like me or be perfect or blah 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 so that is something that's interesting that happened and that's why i like i think it's important if anyone can have an opportunity to talk with therapist i think it's like so valuable because you start to uncover these things that you are basically blind spots of things that happen when you're younger that you didn't realize start to run a loop Mm -hmm. in you and so i think the stigma around therapy should not exist in fact like it should be held up on a pedestal whereas like everyone everyone should be so lucky to talk with a therapist and if you know there's the access is difficult because of it's expensive and you know there's other reasons why it's difficult to get a therapist you know to find the right one but if you have the opportunity man like go for it this is like a life coach you know this is someone that you can go to for advice or for um you know uh, when you're trying to navigate difficult decisions, give you tools. It's like if you're trying to play basketball, you don't go and try and play basketball in a real way without a basketball coach. No, so no one's like, oh, you need a basketball coach? What the hell's yeah. wrong with you? Yeah. It's like, well, that's all. A therapist is like a life coach. It's just like, this is the biggest game of your life. Yeah, <laughs> life. Um, why not have someone there that can help you? Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, where it all stems yeah, from. Yeah, and I think that that's like what I learned from my parents too is just like they were very open about communicating uh, feelings and, and this, you know, my mom is, was a psychologist. And so in the beginning, I rebelled against it because mm. it was like my parents. Of course, you know, everybody. Yeah, everybody and so knows. I went the opposite way. And uh, and now I'm, a, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Uh, and I slowly started to like once I finally found someone that I connected with that I could talk to, you know, and that's who I called for before the commencement address. Hmm. She was the one that gave me this great advice and it really helped. <laughs> like, mm. I, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have her, you know, in that moment. So it's, it's just like a good, a good practice. I think if you can, right. So, um, yeah. So those are two things. Mm. What do you think Ben Empton's purses purposes, excuse me, 
I I think it's just to, to spark people to do the thing, just to do the one thing or the little things that they know they're supposed to be doing or they would love to do, just to give them that little push over the edge, just to yeah. be like, you can do it. You got to do it. Not just you can do it. You have to. Yeah. You have an obligation to be who you truly are. If it's not for you, then it's for other people to yeah. show, to prove to them, to inspire them to do the thing. So, yeah. And I think you're doing it. I mean, you have been doing it for quite some time, man. Thank you know you. what I mean? Like it's, it, uh, it's really just, I, I, I won't be able to ever fully describe the feeling right now or even after the fact, uh, of what it has been like to even first meet you at the yes theory party. Uh, but then to have you here today, it's just, it. The, like I said, man, it's it's it, the ripple effect. The ripple effect is, I've heard it millions of times. Um, and every time that it happens in my life, I just, it's like this awakening of like, you just keep putting out that good energy into the world and you keep, you know, sticking to your lane and just doing what you got to do. And it all full circles at some point. Mm -hmm. Um and it, it's just, it really amazes me that we have even had a chance to meet and talk today. And it's just, it's been absolutely incredible. Um, before I get into the closing questions, this is when I reverse the role. Yeah. Allow the guests to ask me any one question. Could be about something we talked about today, something you want to know about me. Two rules though. One, can't be directly about the podcast. Yep. And two, it can't be a question I already asked you today. Okay. Any one question. All right. Let's get deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So what... So what 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 do you think? Who is the person or the thing? And you talked about Lewis, and mm -hmm. so if it's Lewis, cool. But is there the def, like uh, an inciting moment or thing that happened or person or you know that that created the ripple for you? You know that either caused you to go one direction over the other or do something, make a move. Well, was it? A person or uh was it something that you read or like if you think about what is uh what can you draw this that you're doing now back to yeah i think it was kind of something you had touched on early on in the podcast and something that i you know i had known doing the research was that you just had this moment of surrounding yourself with the right people and i really i can't say one person's name because it wouldn't be it's it's Lewis. Yeah. It's my buddy Nathan Acorn who was starting the clothing line. Really my buddy Dylan Reese who I grew up with who mm -hmm. I saw him making music in our in his basement. He grew up three blocks over from me. Saw him making music in our basement to now full time career nationwide tour, the whole shebang. It's to two loving parents, it's to my sister, it's to the family I was raised by, to the beautiful city that I was raised in, She could be Mass. I mean, I am so fortunate for everything that I've gotten to where in my life today. I love I love that this project has been built on this whole Uber grind of the last three years. And I say it so proudly through all my content because it's giving me a story and it's making me appreciate all these moments so much more. If I had blown up after episode three, four, five, started making all this dough and all this good money, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Like the grind and the and the growth that I've seen in myself in three years, it has been incredible. And it's been a very and a question I I had didn't I didn't get a chance to ask you is like I feel like our 20s. These are the years like, and it's hard to talk about because you everybody thinks that like you graduate college or you don't go to college like 18, 22, whatever. It's now like the you're just like living life. But it now it's this big question mark of like, what mm -hmm. do you do now? There's yeah. no more structure in your life anymore. And that's what I loved was like, that was what the, that was kind of the whole process you guys were going through with the buried life of like, you're in that age bracket of like, what do we do want to do with the rest of our lives? We don't know, but we have this list of a hundred things that we think would be super dope. We don't know how we're going to do it and we're just going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, like that's been at least the last three years since I graduated college to where I'm at. I've just like, I've really, I've just had to fall in love with myself because I've needed to, I've been trying so hard to figure out like, what's my purpose? What does my career look like? Who are the people that I want to be surrounded by with? What's the city that I want to live in, Los Angeles? And slowly but surely, it's just like checking off the, like my own list. Mm -hmm. I've been just checking off doing the things I've always wanted to do. Move to Los Angeles, uh, you know, create creating what I wanted this to become. Everything, everything. Um, 
all that to say, I, I can't credit one person, but I can credit all these people that have played such an inspirational part of my life. Um, and it's been, it's just been, it's just been an amazing ride. I will say, like I said before, Lewis was the inspiration to start yeah. the podcast. Drama felt like my, almost like from afar, my mental coach. Mm -hmm. I saw him showing up on a weekly basis. I knew I needed to show up. And then Gary V for that first like year and a half, I was just consuming his content every single day. And I felt like he was like, like my drill coach. Like you yeah. need to keep showing up. You need to stop looking at the numbers. You need to not care what people think. You need to believe in the vision. Like all those like cliches you hear, he just was like fueling me. And, and then I felt like I was, I almost had my mental coach on a weekly basis talking to people. Every week I was capturing a new story. Literally, it'll be three years next month. And I think of the three years, maybe we missed four weeks total consistently wow. for for almost three years. So it's like I've I've been fortunate to just use this tool as a networking opportunity to get to know people, to take bits and pieces and incorporate into my life. So it almost has been yeah. no, my I mean, guidance, my light, you know? Yeah, it's incredible. I imagine the growth, personal growth that you experience through these conversations. And I think that it cannot be understated because if you look at the the two inciting moments and or decisions for both of us, they're exactly the same. Surrounding yourself with people that inspire you. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make a change in your life, move away from the people that drain energy from you and move towards the people that give energy from, to you. Mm. Because you will, even if you do not do anything, you will subconsciously elevate yourself through osmosis of what these this group, these this circle of people are doing, right? Yeah. So you will see people that you now surrounded yourself with doing amazing things. And subconsciously you will think like, wow, that's really cool. Like, you know, he's a good friend of mine. I know him really well. I could probably do that. Mm. And then you're like, I wonder what I want to do. And that's what happens when you are intentional around the people that you're surrounding yourself with. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Not to mention just the opportunities that come yeah. from meeting those types of people. Yeah. But also the time that you don't waste from dealing with all the BS from the people that you are draining energy from you. Mm. You literally have to move those people out of your life. And it's very difficult when it's old friends it's very difficult when it's a relationship. It's very difficult when it's family. Yeah. But you can at least put up safeguards. You can be conscious of your time and energy that you give and be proactive with surrounding yourself with people that give you ideas, that fire you up, that inspire you. And that's why I love podcasting because mm. even if you don't directly have those people around you, you can tap into all these conversations. There are so many podcasts out there that are providing extreme amounts of value yep. for nothing at all. Yep. And you're able to tap into a conversation as if you're at coffee with these other two, three, four people and just simply listen. Mm -hmm. And that knowledge and that inspiration that you're going to get ends up being the fuel, the belief that you can create that thing you've always wanted to do. Uh, giving you the permission to cut out the people, giving you the permission to actually become the person you've always wanted to become and not being scared to fail because there's literally my sense of like what is failure to when I started this thing to now, there's, it, it's not a question if I'm going to fail. It's what am I going to learn and what what are the steps I need to do to, to just make it happen? Mm -hmm. It's not it, – failure literally is not it, – it's so normalized now in my life of like I don't believe in it that – it's, it's just crazy. I can't even I can't even put it into words because it's like there's no such thing. Yeah. You just learn. You just learn as you go, and all these little gems that you pick up along the way ends up being the best things that are gonna set you up for the next thing that comes in your life. Yeah. It's just part. It's just it's the path. Yeah. It's like it's the bumps in the road. It's it's like filling your toolbox. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, changing direction. I mean, I, yeah. It's it is true, and that is the best way to. To, to think about it because at the, at the end of the day that is your life path yeah. so failure is like you know probably like if you die like that's your or if you're like something catastrophic or like but again as long as you have those basic needs met that i talked about yeah. right there is there is less downside to failure than there is upside yeah way less yeah we'll get into closing questions um where can people find you on social media? Where they, where can they find the buried life? For me, I am at just at 
Ben Nempton, mm-hmm. just the full name on socials. And uh, Buried Life's at The Buried Life, The Buried Life. And mm-hmm. it's one R, mm-hmm. Buried Life. And uh, that's it. Yeah, bennempton.com too is the, the website. website. We'll have it all linked up. Make sure you guys and gals go drop a, drop a bunch of bearded man emojis on his recent <laughs> post so you, he knows you came from the podcast. Um, before I ask the final question, I just want to say thank you again for taking the time to be part of this. It means a lot to me. Uh, it means a lot to I'm going to get on a phone call probably in the next 24 hours with my sister, and we're going to be able to nostalgia from the days of watching Barry Life. But it's uh, it's just been incredible. Um, this podcast is really special to me for the fact of like what you have created with the Barry Life, the ripple effect you guys have had, everything that you're involved in today is so much of what this podcast represents. This this purpose in the youth logo, this brand, this is so much bigger than me. Uh, it is people like you. Like you are the example. The, you are the the types of guests I have dreamed about creating this podcast on. So just for somebody who's so busy, who has a lot on their table, you know, for taking the time to to do this, I can't I can't say it enough. But thank you, like genuinely, thank you for taking the time to do this, man. It really it really means a lot to me. It's my pleasure, man. It's been awesome. Awesome. It's just. Keep doing it. Oh, wait. We're not stopping. <laughs> We're not stopping anytime soon. I promise you that. Last question for you. Yep. What is the best two to three pieces of advice you'd give to somebody that's listening, hasn't found that passion, hasn't found that purpose just yet, is scared, maybe has a sense of direction? What's the best two to three pieces of advice you'd give them? So first, if you can't think about what you're passionate about, you are 100% not alone. You are probably in the majority. So... If you can't think about what you're passionate about, then don't think about it. Try and feel what you're passionate about. And one way to do that is when you think about something, does it excite you? Do you actually get a feeling of butterflies in your stomach? Do you start to feel excited about like what are you actually excited about? That's another way to think about what you're Mm. passionate about because you want to actually feel that excitement when you think about it. So that's one road to go down that you can try. The other is what are you curious about? Like what genuinely are you, do you want to inquire about? Do you want to learn about? What are you just curious about? Go down those roads Mm. and explore them because that might be what you're passionate about. Like that, that's sort of where the, you know, the passion uh, is derived from. Mm. So, you know, that feeling of excitement, that curiosity, uh, and then just write those things down. Just write your list, get a journal, Start your list, whether it's big or small, write it down and then revisit that list every couple months and add to it and cross things off. And you, I guarantee those things that you first write on your list that you thought were impossible over the next two months, four months, year, two years, you'll look back and be like, damn, I actually, I did those things. I used to think that was impossible. I fucking did it. Yeah. That's the way it goes. I love that. Right yeah. on. Ben Empton, man. Absolute pleasure, brother. Thank you so much. We'll catch you guys next time. Cheers. See ya.